Good evening. I don't know if you've noticed, but the weather has been absolutely gorgeous. My birthday was this past Thursday, and it was that first day where it was nice and chilly. I was like, you know, God has blessed me tremendously. I don't know if you know this, but I'm now 20 years old. I am halfway to 40, a quarter of the way to 80. So thank you, Lord, for 20 years. And again, I have to say, I'm no longer a teenager, which I don't think that really means much because I am who I am, so we're all going to have to still deal with that. But anyway, I had a great birthday. I'll just tell you about this because it was so exciting for me. I went to Texas Cattle Company with um, Ted Wheeler from Venice, and uh, they give you a $23 credit to any steak, so I got a 32-ounce porterhouse. I was a happy, happy man. <laughs> But I just figured I'd let you in in that little joy of life that I had this past Thursday. As I walk up here, I can't help but smile. And I'll tell you why. I come up here, and I just start to get this big cheesy grin on my face. But it's because we're all here together to study the Bible. To open God's Word. To learn from it. To see what God has to say to us. And I think that is something that we should all be smiling about here this evening. Amen. Amen. That's right. God's word. If you would open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Now this is a very well known um, chapter. Especially for those that will tell you. You Church of Christ guys will always go to Acts chapter 2. Well, it's because there's some pretty amazing stuff going on in Acts chapter 2. When you look around us at the world today, we see a lot of religious division. We had a movement back in the day called the Restoration Movement. Before that, we had the Reformation. What was the purpose? To go back to the Bible, at least, uh, to get back to the New Testament church. We see it more so um, with the restoration. To get back to be the church of the New Testament, which is the church which Christ established. The title for my lesson this evening is What We Can Learn from the Church in Acts Chapter 2. What is the difference between Acts Chapter 2 and right now? Well, when we look around, we see, you know, there's a different church on every corner with a different name, teaching different things, different ideas. But when you call yourself a Christian, which is the reason I was smiling, because we're going to open the Bible and study it. When you call yourself a Christian and you're representing Christ, do you not want to be and be like what Christ established when you call yourself a church? I would think so, because that's where it started. So what we can learn from Act, from the church of Acts chapter 2. So first, we're actually going to be reading um, verse 40 through 47, 41 through 47. But first, I want to get some context, because there's so much going on in this chapter. So 50 days after the Passover, we have what's going on here. We know that Jesus told the apostles to go into Jerusalem... He said, and wait there, because the promise of the Holy Spirit was going to come to them. He says, go in there and wait, and the power that I promised you, that help, is going to come to you. So then the Holy Spirit comes down on them as they're sitting in that house there and all that good stuff. They stand up and they start speaking in tongues. And then Peter preaches a sermon. Now before we get into my lesson here, I want to talk about this for a minute. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? We can see here, these people that had just crucified Jesus Christ, they realized that the life that they were living right now with those actions that they had just partaken of, they were separated from God. They were separate from God. Apart from God. They're like, we need to fix this. 
And of course, this is after Peter's sermon. And when we think about Peter's sermon, what does he preach to them? Jesus Christ through the Old Testament. I think it's very important, just a side note, as Christians that we study our Old Testament. I feel like sometimes that's a portion of the Bible that, you know, we don't open at all. It's very important. It helps us tremendously to, especially with Revelation, the apocalyptic literature. But I would encourage you to read your Old Testament. But he teaches them Jesus through the Old Testament. And then it comes to that passage. What shall we do? They realized that their life wasn't right. And they needed, they needed to do something. So now we'll continue on. We have people here who realize that they need to do something and then doing it. So we have people who are not saved, right, becoming people who are saved. So they say, what shall we do? And then verse 38, then Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. Every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So that's what they had to do. And with many other words, verse 40, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Now we're going to read down through verse 47, because this is what I want to talk about this evening. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. And sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily, with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That's why we go to Acts chapter 2. How amazing is this passage of Scripture that we had just read? You have people who are not saved becoming people who are saved and who are in God. And the Lord added to the church daily. Brother Glenn, I came in this, this evening. And he said, oh, I'm excited to hear your lesson. It's probably going to be good as always. And I said, well, let's hope so. And he said, well, that's not very confident. And I was like, well, and then I walked, got something to drink, and I walked back in. I said, I'll tell you why. Because I'm going to give everybody here four Fs this evening. And he said, oh, no, it just got way worse. But they're good four Fs. They're a good four Fs. So don't take this personally. The first F that I want to look at this evening is they were faithful to God. Verse 42, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Steadfastly continued. That word continue means to occupy oneself diligently. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved. A workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. We gather here Sunday morning, hopefully Sunday night, hopefully Wednesday. Of course, that's another sermon. Why? The reason I was smiling again. Because we were going to continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, in Jesus Christ's teaching, in the words of God. That's what we're doing here this evening. Continuing steadfastly. Something else to notice from this verse here. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread. Now this in the breaking of bread in the Greek, there's a definite article there. So we know with that definite article, it's talking about the breaking of bread of the Lord's communion. So they're continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Doing those things which Christ set in place and told them to do. They were faithful in the things that God wanted them to do. James 2.14, what does it profit, my brethren? If someone says he has faith, but does not have works, can faith save him? 
How about we put it like this? What does it profit, my brethren, if you call yourself a Christian but do not have works? What does it profit, my brethren, if you sit in a congregation on Sunday morning and Wednesday night but does not have works? But do not have works. Can, can being a Christian, can just being in the church building save that person? Absolutely not. They were baptized. You see, they repented and were baptized for the remission of their sins. And then what? There was something afterwards. Sadly, when we look around us at the world, people think that's the end. They get baptized. They get in that water. They come up and they're like, this is great. I can go to heaven now. And then they go out and live like the Satan the rest of the week. Sunday mornings, they're in here worshiping God. And then the rest of the week, I heard a saying, living like the devil. What makes you a Christian? What we can learn from the church in Acts chapter 2 is that first they were faithful to the things of God. They continued steadfastly. We have this book. We have this book right here, the words of God. How can you continue steadfastly in something you don't know? You can. If you have a job and you don't learn what you have to do by asking questions, by looking to others... You're not going to make it. Same as it is with a Christian. If you don't continue steadfastly, doing your best, occupying yourself diligently with the words of God as a church and sing as a person, it's not going to be good. The second thing that I want to look at from this passage is verse 43. Then fear came upon every soul. Fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. That word fear doesn't mean like Halloween scared, running away kind of thing. It means in a sense of awe, respect. But what I want us to notice here, second point, fearing of God. Then fear came upon every soul, but were all those souls saved? No. We think back to Rahab and Jericho. She says to the um, spies, we remember what happened to the Egyptians, and we are all scared. We know what's going to happen here. But Rahab and her family are the only ones that did anything. And they were saved. So fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through them. They realized that God had the power They realized that this just wasn't just another trick. This was the real thing. That the God who created heaven and the earth was working here. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. Now when we think about Solomon... And all that he had, and all of his wisdom, he had tons of wives. Not sure if he was wise in that. But anyway, he had tons of wives, gold, silver, all that you can imagine to have. And this is at the end of his book here in Ecclesiastes, and this is what he says. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Out of everything that Solomon had accomplished, he said, this, these are the only things that matter. Fearing God and keeping His commandments. Fearing God and keeping His commandments. Understanding that God has the power and that if you don't do what God has told you to do through His Word, which we must continue steadfastly, you're not going to make it to heaven. So what does that mean? You're going to go to hell. They were fearing of God. The third thing that I want to look at this evening is they had fellowship in God. Verse 42b again. And fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then down to verse 46. So continuing daily 
with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Can you believe these people got together outside of church? Can you believe that? And can you believe that they were happy about it? What in the world is going on here? With gladness and simplicity of heart. You got brethren coming into church. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something funny. We went to Central this morning. That's where Tina goes. And I look back and everybody's in the back. And I'm like, why? So I had this thought. It's because they're afraid if they sit up front that they're going to have to talk to somebody going out the back door. I don't know if that's true, but I was just thinking about it. Why do we sit towards the back, Mr. Glenn? No, I'm just joking. Because <laughs> we might have to talk to somebody. But they gathered together with gladness and simplicity in heart. They gathered in the temple, talked about God. They went home, gathered together. The breaking of the bread there is just eating. It's not the um, communion they ate together and had gladness and simplicity of heart can you believe that that's what I'm talking that's a church right there they were happy to be together they were happy to worship together and you know if someone had a problem they could go to that other, some other person did you ever ask somebody how they're doing? Oh, how are you doing? Then they start telling you, like, man, I knew I shouldn't have asked them how they were doing. They're actually going to tell me. That's not how it should be. Gladness and simplicity of heart. When we go to camp, there's gladness and simplicity of heart with all the young people. But sometimes in the Lord's church, well, in any congregation, probably anywhere, it's like people just want to come in, get their time, and get out as quick as possible. But what does the Bible teach? What does the church of the New Testament, how do they act? Because that's what we want to get back to. That's what we want to teach. That's what we want to preach. That's what we want to act like. Because we're the church of Christ. The church which Christ established. They had fellowship in God. Then turn over to Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Wow. Do you see how the church is, church is functioning here in Acts chapter 2? That is some amazing stuff going on right now. We have people who were not saved becoming saved here in Acts chapter 2. We have people being faithful to God, continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. We have people who are fearing of God and following His commandments. We have people who have fellowship in God and are happy about it. Their baptism, the teachings... Them, that's what they had in common. They had God in common that brought them together. When we call ourselves a family, which is going to be our next point, they were one body in Christ. We always say, the preacher will get up here, Christ is the head of the church. Absolutely. The Bible teaches that. We have to be the body. Only one body. Not many bodies. Man, it drives me crazy. You can probably drive up this road. I think there's a congregation right around here somewhere. All the division that we have in the religious world today. And just stemming from the Bible. People not liking to read the Bible. They say, I don't think the Bible teaches that. Well, read it. I don't like that it says that. Well, some people don't like a lot of things. But when it comes to God's word, I'm going to do my best to follow it. Joshua says over in 24 verse 15, he says, but as, you can do what you want, but as for me and my house, we're going to follow Jehovah. That's how it should be. One body in Christ. Our fourth point this evening, a family for God. Now think about a family. They work together. They love one another. They have fun together. They support one another. 
That's what a family is. That's what a family does. So when you say we're a family for God, we're a bo the body of Christ, what does that mean? We should love one another. We should be happy when we get together. Now obviously there's going to be some people who personalities who might conflict with yours. But what brings you together is the word of God. What brings you together is Jesus Christ dying on the cross for your sins and your understanding of that. That's what brings you together. That's what covers all things, Jesus' blood. And it should make those other things not matter. You know, I've come to an understanding here recently, and I have to thank Vettina Benelli. I have a problem. I'm an angry driver. I don't like it when people cut me off. I don't like it when people drive 30 miles under the speed limit. I don't like it when people take 10 minutes to make a turn. I don't like it and it drives me crazy. But Tina says to me, why does that make you angry? It doesn't matter at all. You're still going to where you're going. All it does is, you know, make you upset. Thank you. It doesn't matter one bit if that person takes 10 minutes to turn. I think Mr. Glenn's laughing because he's one of those people who takes 10 minutes to turn. But anyway, I didn't mean to offend anyone. I was just saying some things that upset me. Why does that matter at all? Why should that affect my thinking, my holding fast to what is good? Same as when we're in the building, when we're gathered together as a family for Christ. As Christians, should, man, did you hear what so-and-so said about me? It's ridiculous. That stuff, shouldn't that stuff shouldn't bother us because of this. Because of our common belief in Jesus Christ. We all make mistakes. That's going to happen. We're people. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 but we shouldn't have to be upset about those things. Maybe we need to talk to that person. Certainly so. So what have we looked at so far? They were faithful to God and had the things that he wanted them to do. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Can you believe they like listening to the preacher? Can you believe that? They would say amen too, I bet. I don't know if I bet's a good word. Take that back. <laughs> amen. I agree with what you're saying. That's why, Mr. Tim, I appreciate him. He's always amen. Because we know what's true, and when the preacher's up here saying something true, and you agree with him, you can say amen. <laughs> they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They were fearing of God. They could think back to what Solomon said. The conclusion of the whole matter. These are the only things that matter. Fear God. Understand God's power and His might. That if you don't do what He tells you to do, it's going to be bad. And keep His commandments. They had fellowship in God. I love how the Bible puts it. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. It's like, we're going to eat lunch and we're going to have a good time. Not like the world has a good time, but we're going to get together. You know, I could talk to you about the Bible all night long, not worry about sleep. Why? Because I love it. And I'm sure a lot of you are the same way. I've been studying Jeremiah and some of the passages in there. I just want to call people late at night. Like, man, turn your Bible to Jeremiah. You have to see this. This is amazing. When Jeremiah says, I don't want to preach, God. But I can't help but not do it because your word is a fire in my bones. Man, that's great stuff. They had gladness and simplicity of heart. A lot of you are smiling. Maybe because I'm a little crazy, but because you're happy to be here. Because we're studying God's word. Because we're all here in one accord. With one heart. With one mindset going forward, out of this lesson, I want to take something and put it in my life and become a better Christian. No one's sleeping, so that's good. It's not like I want to come here to take a nap. 
That all equals a family for God. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says this, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. It's because of Christ that we have this um, option to be baptized into his blood. Whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. A body works with many different parts. But try using your body without one of that parts. It doesn't work as well. All these things equal a family for God, the body of Christ. Okay, so we have those four F's. Everybody got four F's. You're not going to fail anything. You're all doing great. You're going to pass with four F's. Mm -hmm. But now I want us to think about what is the church made of? What did we just read? What did we just read? For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. Who makes up the church? All of us. Together and individually. What I want us to look at next. All those things that I mentioned. Faithful to God. Fearing of God. Fellowship in God. Are you doing that? Are you continuing steadfastly? Because the church is made up of many members. Are you continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine? In the words of God, are you? Are you fearing of God? Knowing that if you living today, if today was your last day on earth, are you keeping God's commandments? Are you doing what is essential for salvation? Are you acting like a Christian outside of this building? Not just calling yourself a Christian, but acting like it. Are you? Do you have fellowship in God? Or as soon as the preacher says, or as soon as the prayer said, Amen, are you out the door? Are you happy to be here? Not that there's anything wrong with escaping right away. I don't want anybody to get offended. I don't want to step on any toes. But are you here happy to study God's word? Do you let your sorrows and things that are worrying you go as you come into this building, knowing that nothing else matters? Not work, not school, not your friends. Nothing else matters except God and those around you. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. Because when we stand before God in judgment, we're not going to go as a congregation. You're going to go individually. You're going to stand before God for what you have done on this earth, whether it be good or bad. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. You are by yourself. So are you doing these things that I've set forth this evening? I beg you to look at yourself in the mirror. To think about it. To assess your situation. And if it's not right, I urge you to make sure that you make those changes that you have to make. Because we're not given tomorrow. I hope no one's thinking, there goes Thomas again, preaching to us older people who know much better than him. While I know that is true, this is what the Bible says. It's not about what I say. It's what the Bible teaches. That's why we have to continue steadfastly in the doctrine. I ask you again, if you need to make changes, if you need to come forward because we're a family and we're here to support all, I beg you, I urge you to please come forward or make those changes if they're personal to make sure that you're right with Christ. And if you haven't done what Acts chapter 2 sets out in the sense of be being non-saved to being saved, I beg you to come forward again because you're not given tomorrow. You need to first hear the word. They receive the word gladly. The Bible teaches that he, he, we have to hear. Hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. We need to confess Christ before men. We need to repent of our ways. 
Crucify that old man, Romans chapter 6 says. And then be baptized in that water, which is a likeness of Christ's death. If you haven't yet done that, the Bible teaches that that is what you must do to make sure that you're saved. That's what Acts chapter 2 says. That's part of the Bible. That's why we go there. If you have any needs at all, I ask you to please come forward as together we stand and as we sing. Yeah,